All right, we're going to spend about 45 minutes together now, everyone. And I want to talk to you about spraying techniques for serial disease control. Uh, we will focus on Fusarium head blight, but we'll also talk a little bit about the flag leaf and the, the penultimate leaves of wheat. Um, I want to acknowledge my co-author, uh, Brian Caldwell, is my partner in uh, Agrometrics, our company. And of course, I also want to acknowledge Jason DeVoe, who's not on the author list, but he and I run sprayers101.com, and we'll get back to that at the very end. I uh, just want to make you aware of the website. It's a website that is designed for farmers uh, and practitioners of all sorts to learn more about spraying. It is a website that is free of charge, no advertising, but it is sponsored by the commissions, including Sask Wheat. So thank you for that support. Uh, we do not accept money from any uh, uh, commercial entity so that we stay unbiased in our reporting. So that's my little spiel. So I just wanted to let you know what uh, what we have going on here. Um, I'm just going to uh, put my laser pointer on. I hope you can see that and we'll continue through. So here's some of the collaborators we've used recently uh, uh, from uh, uh, in some recent projects. So the chemical companies are involved as well as some government and uh, commission entities. All right. The main principles of fungicide application are First of all, to know your target, you know, where is the disease going to be? Uh, where does your fungicide have to be? Uh, does the disease migrate within the plant canopy or does it land on the, on the final target? Uh, those kinds of uh, questions should be, uh, should be uh, answered. And then find out where that target is within the canopy. Um, you know, obviously, the head we focused on here is at the top of the canopy, but you can also have leaves and other parts, stems that are further down, and they have a different kind of uh, targeting situation. The mode of action is important, uh, but Randy did, did say something at the very end, you know, where he talked about resistance. I mean, we are losing the trisols for, for most serial diseases, and they are locally systemic, which means that they, uh, they've they spread somewhat uh, on deposition, but they don't move in the phloem, they move in the xylem. So they move in the transpiration stream upward. And they don't, for example, if you hit the leaf, the, the leaf of the tip, they're not going to flow back to the base, uh, the tip of the leaf, they're not going to flow back to the base of the leaf. So the spray droplets actually have to hit that part of the plant. That's true really for most fungicides, we're not able to get the kind of systemic action that we get, for example, from uh, some herbicides. Uh, we make a recommendation to choose a coarse spray in general. Uh, and uh, I've given an example here of a, of a, of a, a spray quality, you know, uh, example from a, a high pro nozzle, the Guardian Air. And you can see that uh, for this particular nozzle, the O4 size and different pressures, they've identified for the user, the spray qualities that they uh, that nozzle produces. We have been recommending the core spray quality for some years, and it's primarily because work that we've done has shown that there's no advantage to spraying much finer. In fact, uh, one of the earliest studies Randy and I did together was with uh, uh, canola, actually, and we did some sclerotinia control. And uh, we sprayed a hollow cone and some finer flat fan nozzles and, and then some coarser nozzles. And the coarser nozzles were every bit as good as the finer sprays. Uh, we learned that the higher pressure was of some value for those coarse sprays, but we didn't see a, a big advantage to spraying the fine sprays, which I, I, I find to be a, a very good uh, observation because you know, in days like, like these, when we have windier conditions and some certainly we've had some hot spells, uh, the larger droplets do pay a dividend in terms of drift reduction and longevity of the drop before it evaporates to dryness, and therefore it's, it's, a, it's a better chance for being taken up. And of course, then we select a spray volume and also accordingly. And, and you know, if, if, if the spray has to go deeper down, more well volume, and we'll, we'll show you some data on that. So let's go to Fusarium. Um, so uh, typically our, our wheat varieties in Saskatchewan these days are awned. Um, the awns are interesting because they're excellent collectors of small droplets. And in our first work with Durham, for example, we discovered that a lot of our finer sprays were actually collected by these awns before they could get to the glooms and the florets that Randy talked about as an inf inspection uh, infection site. So uh, there is an element there. I mean, you notice that there is a flag leaf present. The flag leaves do present an opportunity at, at T3 uh, staging. The flag leaves are obviously uh, 
may still be very green, maybe worth protecting. So they, and most of these, the, the fusarium fungicides obviously have activity on, on the, the leaf spot diseases, as Randy mentioned. So they are a worthwhile target to consider during your T3 application for fusarium. Um, staging is, of course, the big one. I mean, when you look across this year site, this was an outlook a couple of years ago, and the the variation in 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 flowering, and it's it has to do with main columns versus tillers, and and the uniformity aspect, the higher seeding rate that Randy uh, discovered uh, talked about at the beginning of his talk, I think plays a role here in, in getting the staging a little bit tighter. Uh, so those are agronomic issues that uh, we won't be able to talk to uh, in this talk. But ultimately, then it's it's about getting out there and doing the job. Uh, this was a site near Allen we did some some work with, and uh, this particular applicator was uh, was using a fairly fine spray. Actually, uh, he had a large nozzle, but he had a higher pressure, and he you can see the spray plume hanging behind uh, the sprayer. the The question of nozzle selection is a big one. I'm going to list you all the nozzles I think are relevant for this task uh, at the near the end of the talk, but I just want to share with you some uh, some of the challenges in finding out the droplet sizing. Um, we do have an article on this on Spurs 101. It's called What's My Spray Quality in Three Simple Steps. It basically leads you to uh, an easy way of figuring out whether you've got the coarse or the medium or the fine spray that you might want for your fungicide application. The, the data for spray quality are generated using laser instruments. This happens to be a stock photo from TJET that they've used for many years. This is a laser. It's a phase Doppler PDPA. Uh, it shines a laser beam through a spray cloud and, and counts the droplets and also can measure their velocity. And there's other instruments out there that other companies are using. This one is no, no, no longer as common. This is the, the Oxford Visicizer. And uh, you, it takes a, a strobe picture, uh, a laser strobe picture, and gives you a somewhat out of focus image of the droplets, but it has algorithms to figure out how big are these and those ones. And if they're out of focus, it, it eliminates them. Uh, but so it takes a lot of different pictures and counts all the droplets and we get this kind of result out of it and and we often talk about you know average droplet size but in fact all nozzles produce a wide variety of droplet sizes the majority of which are small so this is the number distribution that you see here and over here you see that the peak of this number distribution is at about 100 microns or less so the vast majority of the number of drops are tiny and then the larger drops are relatively few. But when we then convert this number distribution to a volume distribution, uh, we see that the volume, the dose, is actually in a different spot. So very little volume in the tiny droplets, but then significant volume in the intermediate sized droplets. As we get to coarser sprays, this is a medium spray, as we go to a coarse spray quality, the number distribution actually still looks the same. So we still have the majority of the droplets are being tiny and fewer larger ones, but the volume distribution has now shifted to the right towards the, the larger droplets. The majority of the dose is somewhere in the middle here. So between 300 and even 600 microns in diameter, that's where the, that's where the active ingredient resides. And so it really matters what happens to these droplets. If we go extremely coarse, same thing. And now the only thing I wanted to, to note, and maybe we'll go back is, is the number distribution does show the same peak, but look at the overall number. Uh, this is a 600, uh, this is a count of 600 droplets. If we go, oops, if we go back to the other ones, you know, we had 2000 in that same spot for the, for the course. So we are, you know, losing droplets. The distribution is still shaped the same. Now the volume is over here and we do have to worry about this. I mean, these could very well be too large. They may not be retained. They may not be sufficient in number to actually hit the target or provide coverage. And those are the, the considerations. So the, the challenge always in spraying is to kind of compromise these, these variables and kind of find a, a, me, a medium uh, or, or, or intermediate location. So all of our sprays contain small, and large droplets. Um, and that's true for an air induction tip. It's true for a dicamba low drift tip. If we atomize those, we find a lot of small droplets in there. They're just, their dose doesn't contribute very much and that's why their drift isn't very high. 
uh, but they're still there. The larger ones are the dose and the smaller ones are important because they provide coverage. And you can see the tiny ones even in this, in this image here, they're, they're in there. Um, typically the, the large drops are captured by large targets. So the wheat head, the, the, the florid, uh, the gloom are considered large targets in the spray world. They're, you know, much bigger than say a cotyledon or let's say an on. An on is a small target, a vertical target. They capture the small droplets. You even get, even when you spray an inter, you know, a mixed spray at a weed head, you're going to get some kind of partitioning. You're not going to find large droplets on the ons and you'll find the large droplets on the weed head itself. So it is a, a bit of a way of, of affecting your ultimate targeting. The, the way the industry has decided to represent spray qualities is with a color-coded system and a qualitative descriptor of medium coarse, very coarse, extremely coarse. Uh, there's a new standard out that we're going to be adopting where they switch the blue and the yellow for medium and coarse. So that's going to be a bit of a learning curve for us. But we are targeting right now the blue spray quality for our general purpose fungicide sprays, maybe even into the green in some cases. Um, the companies are doing a pretty good job. Uh, so they are publishing these uh, charts. I showed you one from Hypro before. TJet does it in this format where you can see all of their nozzles, sizes, all of their pressures. And you can see the majority for the flat fan nozzle or medium to fine. As you get into an air induction tip, you get coarse to very coarse. And then you can see, look, if I'm going to be spraying the AI XR11004 and I want a very coarse to coarse spray, I better go above 40 PSI. So, you know, just a little, little things. The, the dicamba nozzles, of course, are not suitable for fungicides. Uh, you can see the ultra coarse spray quality here, even at very, very high pressures, they're still too coarse. Uh, the companies published this. I showed you some excerpts from T-Jet. Hypro has a similar excellent catalog. They also have an app. Greenleaf has a catalog and an app. John Deere does as well. So easy to find this information. What we did, um, when, um, when we started getting into app development, uh, we developed an app uh, called Spray Quality, which is available on this uh, website called agrometricsapps.com. I'm just working uh, on revamping the site a little bit. So the, not all the apps are, are working as they should, but I think they are as of this morning. This one is, is a Spray Quality. So it's this one here, you click on it, works on any phone, works on a desktop. Uh, you have filters in there. You can you know, add or subtract different manufacturers if you don't, don't want to see certain nozzle brands uh, in the feed. You can just simply say, what nozzle is this? Or find me a new nozzle. It'll take you through a process. If you go to what nozzle is this, you just, and you or find me a nozzle, it'll, you just type in the word twin here. And any nozzle name that has a twin <laughs> word in it uh, will come up. It's a filter. And you just choose one. I chose the Guardian Air Twin. Uh, it then tells me how many sizes are available for the Guardian Air Twin. I chose the white or the 08 for fungicide. And here you go, Hypro Guardian Air Twin 11008. It delivers 0 0.8 US gallons at 40 PSI. And here's the spray quality at various pressures. So right away, you know, if I want a, a coarser spray, I should be running at 50 to 60 PSI and not much higher than that. And if I wanted to be a little bit more coverage and the, the wind is uh, acceptable, you can certainly go finer. Um, ultimately though, the, the water sensitive papers, I've already shown you them. They're also a very good indicator. If you haven't got an app, I really recommend putting these in your canopy. They are a nice way of visualizing where the spray is going. Instantaneous visualization, they're qualitative for the most part. You basically get a feel for whether it's good or not, but you can also get apps that'll take a picture of the card and give you a coverage number. So that's, uh, that's useful for quantitative comparisons. Um, okay, let's go. Let's talk about canopy penetration. There's a lot of uh, confusion about what droplets actually do once they're released from a nozzle. And so in this case, uh, we've measured the velocity of droplets uh, at the tip when they exit the tip, depending on the spray pressure, they're typically going about 70 kilometers per hour. And as we go to the target area, uh, remember, this is for a stationary tip measuring velocity. The large drops are still going pretty fast, but the small drops have slowed down quite a bit. And even if we were to increase the spray pressure on this particular nozzle, the small drops would still be going small. They just have a uh, low momentum, low, uh, you know, they, they're affected by air. And as a result, they, they just slow down. And it's very, very difficult to direct them uh, anywhere. They have a mind of their own. So they arrive a little later. Okay, 
Um, if we were to now go forward at a certain significant travel speed, you can see this particular sprayer has twin nozzles on it. You can see they're being swept back and you can see the smaller droplets in the spray plume hanging behind that sprayer. What's going on here? So we usually can't see the large droplets. They're uh, just in a, on an, any given day. They're actually, although they're larger, they, they're fewer in number. They refract the light differently. So they're actually more or less invisible. We always see the small drops though. So sometimes that gives us a bit of a wrong indication. When we have a, a spray plume comprised of both large and small drops, the large drops tend to uh, fall at the front of that plume. They're most resistant to air resistance and their actual direction is a vector. And it's a vector that's a combination of their downward and their forward trajectory. And so they're going fast down and they're going fast forward and therefore that's the vector. As they migrate further and further down, the influence of downward velocity is decreased. It's simply now more or less gravity and the influence of the forward vector is reduced because they've also been swept back and have slowed down due to air resistance. It happens really quickly. So sedimentation and gravity actually start to dominate as a deposition variable or factor. The small droplets reside at the back of the plume. They're swept back very quickly by air and they basically go whichever way the wind blows. So there's not a lot we can do about directing them. We can point them forward and they say, you know, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna do this for exactly two inches and then I'm gonna go my own way. And it doesn't matter whether you accelerate that drop with higher pressure. It doesn't uh, matter whether you point it more forward or backward. Uh, their trajectory is ruled by aerodynamics. Okay, let's talk about collection efficiency. All objects have some kind of airflow around them. The large drops have a significant change of direction and that only the, the, the large objects and only large drops can go through them. Uh, the small drops move with air, as I described. And so they actually will migrate around that target. So large targets actually have relatively poor collection efficiencies of uh, small droplets. And this was so, sort of always apparent to me, you know, I, I, I used to live in Ohio and I studied there and we would drive home for Christmas and we would inevitably be hitting some bad weather in the winter and, and uh, right around, you know, Minnesota usually. And, uh, and so what would happen is, you know, we'd get into freezing fog or something and it takes a while for the windshield actually to get, to get frozen droplets on it because the, the, the small droplets are so effectively swept back by that aerodynamic barrier. But the aerial on my truck always froze up. So it's a small, it's a small object and it really collected those little frozen fog uh, particles very, very effectively. Uh, so that's really what's happening here. So here we have a grassy target or an on or a cotyledon and very little change of direction of the air. Small droplets aren't affected by that small change of direction. They will impact. Large droplets will miss it probably by virtue of the fact that there are relatively few droplets in the first place. There's not many and they, they might be statistical really. And also they may bounce off. Uh, the grasses are often difficult to wet. So the large drops may have too much momentum to actually hit and, and stick. So in a canopy situation, uh, if we were to simulate sort of a small droplets uh, that might go you know, selectively around some targets and then ultimately cascade their way to the bottom of the canopy, they might actually hit that uh, weed or, or something that's at the bottom and ultimately uh, create some wetting. Um, the large droplets will very likely basically just go in a straight line and hit the first object that they encounter and will that will likely stop it. So the, the leaves that cover objects, desirable objects for coverage act as umbrellas and large droplets simply aren't going to go there. The rule of thumb really is if you, if you have a bird's eye view over your canopy and you look straight down and you look at the you're looking for the target that you're trying to cover to protect it from disease. If you can see that target, then very likely a larger drop will do just fine, as long as you have enough coverage and water volume. If you can't see it, it's hidden underneath some other leaves, then very likely you will need a finer spray because you'll want that drop to change direction. And it has to go around those objects, those obstacles that we described. Uh, spray quality. I mean, this is really um, sort of a, a, a 
good and bad story. The fine droplets, uh, you know, the small ones that drift, the fine sprays have a lot of small droplets, good for coverage, uh, but they may not last long. They may evaporate quickly, they may drift. The coarse droplets have, you know, still some small droplets, but, and still relatively few large droplets. So we have a slightly better situation where more of them will live longer, but relatively few will still miss the target or, or bounce off. And the extremely coarse ones are the exact opposite is where we have almost no driftables, good for herbicides, uh, but droplets are simply too large and, uh, and, and may, may not deliver the dose accurately. We did some work. Um, this is the Agriculture Canada lab. They were kind enough to allow access to this lab uh, as part of the grant. And we used the, the spray facilities there to do some of the work. I want to just describe what we did. We looked, uh, we used real plants that we set up in a canopy, uh, realistic row spacings and densities. Uh, we put collectors at the height of the heads at the flag leaf and the penultimate leaf height. And we did sort of a quantitative assessment of the amount of spray that hit each of those collectors and assumed that this would be head, a flag leaf, et cetera. We did the same for broadleaf targets. We used a dye, uh, we used various configurations of nozzles. And, and before I go to the results, I do want to give you this perspective again. This is from Kelly Turkington, uh, who also uh, very much an expert on on Fusarium head blight. And he, he made these basic rules so that I adapted slightly, you know, in terms of what's important for you, for your success in fungicide application. The decision to apply remains perhaps the scouting decision, the ability to determine whether you've got a risk or not uh, is still your most important decision. The timing and the choice of product is perhaps your second most important decision. If you make bad decisions in those first two, you're not going to be able to rescue them with an application method. What you can do with application method is position the spray in a way to take advantage of the good decisions you've already made. So most of our products are triazoles. They're actually rated for suppression only, even the newest ones. And so we're not going to be able to turn a, a, a suppression of a product into a a complete 100% success story. Um, notice Randy said five applications that he made, uh, that Gersa had made uh, in, in, uh, over the course of a season, still had disease, still had fusarium, still had, had, had FDK. And that is a fundamental problem of the chemistry that we can't really overcome. So I just wanted to give that perspective. Um, you're gonna be using spray methods to help. All right. Here's the results that we gained from the Fusarium head blight work. Uh, first one, angled nozzles work. And we got this, this is, I have to credit North Dakota State. Uh, when, when Fusarium head blight hit Western Canada in the 90s, we looked to, to the SCAB research at NDSU. Vern Hoff and Marsha McMullen did excellent work. And they said, angle your nozzles. And we basically wrote a grant application and said, let's study this. And this is what we found. Um, if you were to look at the spray deposition on a wheat head from a single nozzle moving forward at a slow speed, the majority of the spray would hit the front side of the head and some smaller amount would wrap around and hit the back. And that's kind of our benchmark number that we're going to list here. Um, if we were to go to a double nozzle, one forward, one backward, but everything else is still the same, uh, still going five miles per hour, the spray amount is a little bit less on the front and there's still wrap around. And it's less, this is from the forward facing nozzle, by the way. And it's less because this nozzle is half the size. So it's, it's not half, it's more than half because it's pointed forward. So it's a better targeting situation. And now the backward facing nozzle does deliver some to the front, but actually does a much better job of delivering to the back. So when we add these numbers together, we actually have relatively good uniformity between forward and backward side of the head. Remember these fungicides do not translocate. So they're not gonna to move to the back of the head if you don't hit the back of the head. And that is an important consideration. Now, uh, greater angles are indeed better. So we did this again, we did uh, narrow angles, uh, a 30 degree off the vertical. Uh, and the, we, did, we went relatively fast, uh, about, about 10 miles per hour. Uh, and these are air induced. So they're coarser, I tried to depict that with the line. 
And then we, we looked again at the deposition. Now look at the front is still similar to what we had before, but the back much less wrap around because much coarser spray. The front uh, from the rear facing nozzle, not that much. And also not that much from the back facing nozzle either, which is simply probably going too fast and our, our angles aren't aggressive enough. We did get material on the back and it did, it was better than we probably would have got from a single nozzle, no question about that. If we were now to increase the separation of these fans to a 60 degree off vertical, everything else is the same. We're now improving the deposition on the forward nozzle by a fair bit, uh, still no wraparound. And we're improving the deposition on the backward nozzle also by a fair bit. Um, so the amount is still not as uniform as it was when we went very slow in the first slide, but we significantly increased the deposition of the spray on the rearward, uh, on the rear, the back of the head, the, 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 the part that's hidden from the approaching nozzle. So that, that is an important consideration. Uh, the core sprays are really important. Um, if we look at a fine spray, uh, widely separated here, and we look at the deposition from the forward facing and the backward facing tip, uh, we're seeing pretty good results. Um, when we went to a, a coarser spray, the overall amount really increased. And uh, even though we may have lost some on the back here, the part of this is due to variability from experimentation, but the overall amount of deposited is significantly greater. So the angle of the forward angling nozzle was more effective at translating it into a deposit on the forward facing part of the wheat head uh, that way. The backward facing improved, um, but not as much as we'd hoped. And blow boom heights. So this is a very key one. Uh, all of the work on you know angled sprays is relatively uh, irrelevant, I guess, if your boom is is much too high. So this is now with a single nozzle. It's a forward angled nozzle. Again, simulated weed heads. Um, so this is the amount that we found on the weed head. Here's a 12 inch boom height, an 18 inch boom height, and a 30 inch boom height. If we look at a 30 inch boom height first. This is uh, what we found with fine, medium, and coarse sprays. Notice that the fine was a little less in terms of deposition. We went to 18-inch boom heights. We now have a very uh, clear separation between fine, medium, and coarse sprays, the coarse ones being superior. And now when we went to even lower boom, we've essentially doubled or even possibly tripled the deposit of some of these sprays because of that lowering of the boom. I know this is a challenge. Uh, it's not easy to go to a 12 inch boom height without uh, dipping into the canopy and having other problems. But if you can, uh, it seems to be well worth it. It retains the uh, useful trajectory of the angled sprays. Okay, let's go into some other data. Uh, this is now again, boom height on a different experiment. And uh, we used the Wilger nozzles for this one. Uh, and I, I just want to, it basically corroborates the, the, the information I just showed you. What we did initially was without a canopy. Now this is with a canopy. And uh, so there was interfering elements there, but you can notice hopefully that the, uh, at the 20 inch uh, boom height, the, the deposit on the wheat or the simulated wheat head amongst the other wheat heads was greater than at a 30 inch boom height. We gained about another 30 or, or so percent uh, on the deposition. Lower down, this is now the, uh, the flag leaf and the penultimate leaves, the boom height did not matter. Remember the set the, the, these are covered by sedimentation. So the, 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 the droplet doesn't have to be moving forward. It just has to be moving vertically and it ultimately does. Um, if we look at boom height for broadleaf cannabis, just as a matter of, of comparison, much less sensitive to boom height. So the 20 inch had no advantage over the 30 inch uh, and lower down again, uh, identical situations. We're not talking about a vertical target, an exposed vertical target. We're talking at best about a stem. Uh, and that, I didn't consider that here, but we are really looking at, at leaves that are horizontally oriented and the boom height is much, much less critical. Water volume was an interesting one. We actually found uh, less benefit from higher water than we expected. In fact, we found next to no benefit from higher water volumes. The proportion of the spray deposited remained just below half on the wheat head. So there was really no uh, interfering elements uh, other than other wheat heads. 
and there is no filtering of the water by those uh, by those interfering elements. It was pretty well straightforward. Uh, the uh, flag leaf benefited, and you uh, well the flag leaf had much more deposit, uh, and but there was really no real advantage to having more water. Uh, even at the lower canopies. Remember, the, the wheat canopy is relatively open in most cases, particularly later in the season. We did have desiccated plants in this stand. We didn't have the lush green uh, that might have uh, occurred at you know, some of the uh, earlier stagings uh, where the canopy is still, still uh, lusher and greener. Uh, for broadleaf canopies, I just want to make this comparison. Um, this is a slightly different configuration, but here's 10 miles an hour. Here is uh, the upper canopy, and here is the lower canopy, hidden amongst a bunch of other leaves. When we went to higher water volumes, the, the benefit to the upper canopy wasn't that great, but there was a benefit to the lower canopy. And we essentially doubled the amount of spray uh, deposit that we achieved there. This is active ingredient. So we doubled the active ingredient. I think, I don't have the statistical error bars here. I don't believe this was statistically significant, but it is something worth noting. There was a, a fairly, you know, I think it's a trend uh, at best. It's something to observe. Um, the, the benefit of this higher water isn't just that it delivers more active ingredient. It just simply also delivers a higher drop of density. And when density is critical for uh, coverage, then that does pay huge dividends. When we do uh, sort of a theoretical assessment of spray quality, so this is the this is our actual sprays that we sprayed, and we calculated the deposit density from the distribution that we achieved per square centimeter. This is this is deposits per square centimeter, and here are some volume median diameters of some sprays. Uh, what we're seeing is uh, that the you know we we basically draw a line at about a hundred deposits per square centimeter. That's about what we think is required for good fungicide performance. This is something that Jason says at Spurge One Hundred One with his experience on fungicides. This is work that Syngenta has done. And they actually publish with their water sensitive papers where they say actually 80 drops per square centimeter is a threshold. I've drawn the line at 100. And I just want to show you that, you know, we, we have excessive coverage. I mean, let's face it, this is more coverage than we actually probably need. Is there value to having this coverage? But here we're, we're below. Uh, and we, and the, the best way to bring us up to that higher volume is actually, and I've just reproduced it here without the, with a slightly better bar, is to actually increase, just bump the volume up. If you have a very coarse spray here or an extremely coarse spray with a high VMD, uh, you can make them work by bumping up your water. That's really the, the rule of thumb here. Um, so that's what I want to share with you. Um, work that we did with Lent, uh, this is peas. Uh, this was um, a few years ago, we did, did this with PAMI and CNH. And I just want to show you the principles of, of water and density uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, admittedly, it's not wheat, but here is a, a deposit uh, at the top of the canopy at five gallons, at 10 gallons, and at 15 gallons. Uh, this is averaged, uh, this I forget now, I think this was a flat fan. I don't remember the exact uh, spray that we used here. I should have noted that. Um, when we went to the mid canopy, we're seeing a lowering of the deposit density uh, in all cases. And we went to the bottom of the canopy, almost at ground level for five gallons. We saw almost no droplets, uh, certainly more at the higher water volumes. When we then counted these, uh, the deposits uh, using uh, image analysis software, uh, we found that you know, only the 10 and 15 gallons per acre on average achieved our target counts of 100 drops per square centimeter. And when we looked at them in relation to where they are in the canopy, uh, the top of the canopy at five gallons, certainly adequate, but if you had to go down to the bottom, it would not be. Uh, 10 uh, gallons and 15 gallons. And 15 gallons, he wasn't even able to achieve it. Uh, so we just have a strong filtering effect here, but certainly in the mid canopy where some of your, your leaves may reside uh, that are worth protecting uh, still adequate coverage. Water volume is simply your most powerful tool in this regard. A lot of people want to use spray pressure though. And uh, so, you know, when I speak to customers they talk about uh, forcing the spray into the canopy. 
and um, and and basically, you know, fogging it in, as, as some people say. We have found no evidence that a higher spray pressure improves canopy penetration, even of the harder broadleaf canopies. Uh, so at a, a 20, 40, and 60 psi, lower down 20, 40, and 60, uh, even lower down the higher pressures really didn't add much. Um, this, I believe, I can't actually read that because of my, my uh, oh yeah, this is a twin nozzle. Um, and we just are looking at uh, configuring them differently. So we have a forward facing nozzle and a backward facing nozzle. And we either turn the backward facing nozzle off and put everything through the front nozzle. We have them equally distributed as our most twin fan nozzles. And then we have a nozzle at the front shut off and just the back one operating. This is at 10 miles per hour. So here we have all front, all back, and here's the twin. When we look at the wheat head, uh, the upper, uh, the upper part, the all front actually had the best deposition. Remember the forward angling on uh, with a forward facing nozzle was in fact the most powerful tool even on a twin nozzle. Uh, split 50-50 or all back, still not bad though. Now, what was interesting was when we went to the penultimate leaf, uh, sorry, in the, this is the flag leaf location, we found that when we switched from a forward facing nozzle to a twin to a backward facing nozzle, we got the opposite trend. So the, the backward facing nozzle does have some value in avoiding hitting the head and actually then sedimenting uh, more vertically down to uh, deeper into that canopy. The way I kind of look at it is if we're in a situation where we want the best of both worlds, you know, the twin nozzle is uh, is basically the middle ground here, and you you possibly get the best of of both of those configurations. All right, now uh, some uh, twin nozzles have the opportunity to configure them so that you have a different uh, spray quality forward and backward, and we looked at whether you know the the back being coarse, the front being coarse, and the back being fine, how that looks uh, versus, uh, versus uh, the other way around. So uh, when, um, when the back was, this is the upper, the upper canopy, uh, when the, the back of the twin nozzles was coarse and the back was, uh, uh, I'm confused. Let me go, let me just go through here and build this, build this graph. And so I can, <laughs> there's been too many graphs. Um, I believe if uh, I, sh I did review this and I'm, I've just lost my train of thought here. I believe that the idea was when, oh yes, here's the front that's coarse always. And then when the back was coarse, we had this much in the upper and this one in the middle. But when the back was fine, this one in the upper and the middle. When the front was fine and the back was coarse, we had slightly less. And when all of them were fine, we had even, even less. And we felt when we looked at these numbers, they're not that dramatically different. Uh, we felt that there was some evidence that configuring all of the nozzles into coarse sprays uh, was perhaps the most advantageous. So, um, you know, even though the, the, fine the fine droplets may contribute some coverage in terms of deposition on the, on the wheat head, making everything coarse, uh, had uh, this you no know, by by a small margin, but had overall the largest deposit on the wheat heads. All right, and we're getting near the end here, but I want to just share you share with you one one last thing, and that's travel speed. If you look at the uh, the backward facing nozzle and the forward facing nozzle are 015s for a an 03 combined rate. So this is a, a twin, and this is with everything facing back uh, facing forward, and then this is the 03. Uh, front and back. So for an 06 total twin or everything uh, facing forward at five and 10 miles per hour. So when we had the twin, well, we had this kind of a deposit. So on the, on the upper wheat head, slightly less on the flag leaf, when we configured everything pointing backward, actually very, very, very similar. Very, so a, a single nozzle pointed forward is as effective as a twin forward and backward in this particular study. Uh, when we went faster, a twin 03 forward and backward versus an 06 uh, pointed just forward, the single nozzle had actually slightly better deposit and slightly worse deposit uh, deeper in the canopy. So uh, the reason we did this work is because North Dakota State 
Uh, their current recommendation, and admittedly that is now a little bit dated because uh, many of the people have retired and may not have been updated, they still recommend a single nozzle. They found, like we did here, that a single forward-facing nozzle actually had the best targeting of the wheat head. The, the consideration here is what about lower down? We may be losing a little bit by doing that. Uh, what about the, the wraparound? What about the, the back of the head? How important is that portion? And we may be losing a little bit there as well. Okay, let's talk about nozzles themselves and, and nozzle options. Um, there's a lot of different uh, twin nozzles out there. Uh, some of them are uh, narrower angled, some of them are wider angled, some are um, symmetrical, some are asymmetrical. Uh, and you know, this one happens to be the Greenleaf nozzle, the TADF turbo drop asymmetrical dual fan. So it has a, a different angle forward to backward. So this is actually a reverse orientation. They actually have the backward facing one uh, pointed forward and then the forward facing one going straight down. And then they alternate along the boom. So you can see here's the configuration of the second nozzle with this jet here is actually now pointing backwards and vice versa. So. Um, the idea behind an asymmetric fan, and this is some work we did for T-Jet when they came up with the AI3070, is that the forward-facing angle doesn't have to be as great because you get forward travel speed. But the backward-facing angle has to be significantly greater because you are moving away from that direction and you have to project it as, as far, you know, in the backward vector as possible. Um, when we could, when we did this work, uh, here's the AI3070, here's the the front of the of the simulated wheat head, here's the back of it, and here are both of them uh, added together. Uh, so that's the asymmetric dual fan. We compared that to another twin fan, the uh, the air induction turbo twin jet. It had uh, has a narrower fan, and so had lower deposition, still within uh, variability though, but overall lower. And then the, the single nozzle, the AIXR, which is an air induction fan, uh, competitive amounts, but notice that one thing I would say is a very, uh, you know, a very significant separation between the forward and the backward facing. This is really only wrapping around a deposition here. When we went at different travel speeds, this is kilometers per hour. So that's about five miles per hour. And that's about 10 miles per hour. Not exactly uh, uh, commercial speeds with a high clearance sprayer, but uh, we found no significant effect of travel speeds in those in, 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 in that speed range. A uh, little bit noisy, as you said, as, as you saw, but very similar deposition amounts. And then the boom height. So this one actually strongly corroborated the previous work on boom height, 30 inches, 20 inches, and 15 inches. Uh, when we essentially halved the boom height, we essentially doubled or more the deposition on the weed head. So that's, that's really perhaps one of the most significant and consistent results we found in all of this work over the years, uh, the importance of low booms. We also uh, did different orientations. We pointed, uh, we did a 30 forward, 70 backwards. We did a 70 forward, 30 backwards, and we alternated them uh, as the uh, TADF would have done. No significant differences between those orientations. It's just generally a spray cloud that uh, is, uh, is hitting the, the, the head. Okay, we're in the final stretch, everyone, and I wanted to just share with you uh, some of the current options you have for twin fans. We do recommend twin fans. Uh, many of the uh, fungicide manufacturers for Fusarium head fights recommend the twin fans on labels. Um, and it had, there's been a, uh, enough research, I think, that it's a sound recommendation. Lots of choice here. Um, these are all air induced. So these would not, not be recommended for a pulse width modulated system. Um, Hypro Twin Cap is a nice system. It's been around for quite a long time. It allows you to configure it to your liking. So you just simply put the nozzle of choice in here, different spray qualities, different flow rates. Uh, as long as it fits into this opening, uh, you're good to go. But they've also developed a very nice twin fan that's compact. This is the Hypro Guardian Air Twin. John Deere also sells it under the same name. Air induced uh, produces a, a, a coarse to medium spray quality at somewhat a slightly higher pressures. Uh, excellent fungicide tip. The TADF I mentioned made by Greenleaf, 
Um, this is uh, the forward facing and the backward facing, two different angles. You have the opportunity of putting two different flow rates in there. That's what they've done. You can see different colors in here. So they actually put a lower flow rate in the front and then a narrower fan angle and higher flow rate in the back, all to help the, 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 the position on the rear, rearward facing uh, part of that uh, um, I'll move that, that part of the weed head that you're moving away from. Albas is a French manufacturer. Uh, they used to be distributed through Hyper. They're now distributed through Greenleaf, the manufacturer here, and they make ceramic tips. So they've had the AVI twin for many years. Leckler is now the new partner with Hypro. Uh, their ceramic line is uh, renamed under the Hypro, and I don't have those names current here, but Leckler calls it the IDKT, Injector, injector Ducic Compact Twin. So it's a, it basically means air induction, small. Yeah, we got it. But it, it's a German, uh, a German abbreviation. They also make a, an injector Duce, a twin that's nozzle uh, for a twin asymmetric IDTA. This one happens to be ceramic in this picture uh, sold by Hypro in North America now. A very cool tip, uh, similar to, to these asymmetric ones. And here's the TJ AI-3070 I showed before. Now, if you have a pulse width modulation system, there are a few to consider. Uh, Wilger uh, is on case sprayers. Uh, they've long made this Y adapter that you can fit individual nozzles to, very popular with case. Hypro has come up with a single nozzle that's uh, called a 3D nozzle. This nozzle in its original configuration is relatively fine. So it, it will produce a medium spray at average no, uh, pressures at the higher flow rates and lower pressures, you can get this into a coarse spray quality. I'm a little worried about that for the trajectory reasons, but they are now, if they're not already released, but they will soon be releasing a low drift version of this very nozzle, which is going to be very, very welcome. They also make a guardian nozzle, also not air induced. It, it has a little arrow here and it shoots forward 20 degrees off the vertical. It's not a great angle, but it's something and will help. Uh, Arag is a, 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 an Italian company distributed by Nozzle Ninja now in Canada, and they make something called the TFLD, which is a twin non-air induced tip. Unfortunately, it doesn't come in the very large flow rates. TJET has just released a new um, um, Nozzle APTJ. Um, I'm not sure now, APTJ, I think it's, um, is it Active Pulse Twin Jet? I'm not exactly sure exactly what it stands for, just released, made for PWM. Um, it's about a 60 degree, so it's very similar to, to these ones. Uh, it is a true 60 degrees or 30 degree off the vertical. Um, and it looks like it's a, an ultra coarse spray quality. It looks like it's primarily for dicamba. We'll have to look at it and see whether it might have a room, uh, some room at a higher pressure for fungicides. They've long made these nozzles. These, these two here happen to be air induced. So they, they should have been in the other chart, but they also allow them for PWM. The TTI 60 is probably too coarse for fungicides, but the AI TDJ 60 isn't. So this one is again, sort of an intermediate spray quality, coarse to very coarse, not bad at all. And then of course, a, a non-air induced one, the turbo uh, teach that this is actually the turbo i should have called this a turbo twin jet that's my bad uh this is not none of these three have a very wide fan angle separation they advertise them as 60 degrees but they're actually 30 they're 15 forward and 15 backward and i don't think that they're your first choice for fusarium because of that uh at richtown in ontario helmet spicer art shafsma uh dave hooker uh, did fusarium work and they actually like the turbo flood jet uh, on a drop tube they pointed them straight forward and straight backward and had very aggressive action on the weed heads uh, they had their best results with this it's a combination of a coarse spray and an aggressive angle that's really what it is and uh, and and yet we haven't seen wide adoption of these i want to uh, maybe just talk about uh what uh, what North Dakota State has done. Uh, they, have, they have put all of their results together in, in some great publications, and th these are worth looking at. Um, so I, I just want to recommend their excellent work over the past many years in this area. Um, they, I just want to review their current recommendations. We may as, well, may as well talk about them. They are still talking about a find a medium-sized drop, uh, not very big, 
and they're talking about an 80 degree flat fan nozzle. I disagree with that recommendation. We found those sprays to be hung up on the awns and we found the trajectory to be difficult to retain. But this perhaps is the, the result of a slightly older data set, I'm not sure. They did in fact pioneer the twin nozzle. Um, they do say to angle all flat fan nozzles forward 30 to 45 degrees down from horizontal. So they don't talk forward from vertical, they talk down from horizontal. So when they say 30 degrees is preferred over 45, they agree with us. They say the wider the separation, the better. 30 degrees forward, uh, down from horizontal is 60 degrees forward. So that is uh, a similar thing. They're saying, you know, remember it's, uh, that they may have a tradition of not spraying high volumes and they want to just remind people that, that the, the, the labeled volume is appropriate. And they have a recommendation of going very low, just like we have, this one seems a little, little low. I'm not sure if it's possible at, at our, with our modern sprayers, but nonetheless, um, that is what they're recommending. I, I want to say something about aircraft very quickly, no data. Uh, timing is the key. Timing is absolutely king. If you're at the growth stage to spray fungicide, and you can drive your sprayer in the field or get the work done, by all means, hire the aircraft. Uh, putting it on is more important than putting it on perfectly. I'm not saying it's not perfect, but they certainly don't have the option of, of, of a very coarse spray and they don't have the option of a twin nozzle. So they are going to be deposition, depositing with uh, travel speed and wind direction. And there, there is actually even some results that uh, were published uh, earlier by North Dakota State on this. So let's finish. The ideal application for Fusarium Head Blight is correct staging, obviously, is very key. Uh, the boom, I think I'm saying 20 to 24 inches. Uh, you know, I guess I'm just trying to be realistic. I, I do operate spurs myself, and I know that when you have a 120-foot boom, uh, going lower than 20 inches is very, very challenging consistently, and the manufacturers ought to be pulling up their socks on giving us better products there. The wider twin fans are absolutely better. Um, so the, this is the this is the 15. You know they advertise it as 60. It's not. That's the turbo twin fan. Um, coarse to very coarse is actually the spray cold we want for Fusarium head blight. Um, it certainly provides efficacy and provides superior deposition. And not going too fast certainly helps uh, in that regard, especially also with keeping your booms lower. Uh, we don't often talk about. We didn't talk about productivity here, but you know, having a good tender system and being organized and maximizing your spray time on any given spray day is of course the key to, uh, to making the slow travel speeds and the higher water volumes work. And of course the, the larger volumes. I wanna thank uh, Sasquit for the opportunity to speak to you today. I wanna to remind you that uh, Spurs 101 is a website that is uh, supported by Sasquit and the other commodity groups in Western Canada. Uh, that we at uh, Jason and I publish. We have some fun on the site and we're putting material out there that we hope is useful for, to make your spray job better. So with that, Dallas, I'll turn it back to you and uh, perhaps we have some questions. We do. We have two questions here. Okay. Uh, the first is from Trevor Anderson. Uh, he says, so for optimum penetration through a dense canopy, a smaller droplet size is better. Yes, I think so. Uh, the dense canopy is, of course, the key. Uh, if the canopy is dense enough that it obscures the targets you actually need to cover, then, then that is absolutely true. But let's go back to the principles. It's dense, but where's the disease? So that, that's first. If the disease is at the top, then, then the dense density is actually not, not that relevant. But let's, let's face it, you know, the broad leaf canopies that are dense, a lot of our disease comes up from the bottom. So there is, there, 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 that is maybe just a theoretical point, but do take the, make the effort to figure out where your disease actually is and where your spray needs to go in relative. Okay, and the next question is from Doug Fair. Tom, if dealing with a non-on cereal variety, would a medium spray be appropriate? Possibly, Doug, you know, the, with the, I, I think that the ons are a collector of the finer sprays, but also the fine sprays just simply go and don't go forward and backward as you intend for them to by choosing a, a twin nozzle. You know, when we look at sprays out of a twin nozzle with a medium spray quality, uh, they get deflected by forward travel speed and by wind. And when we've looked at 
how they deposit in the, on the forward and backward side of a target under windier conditions. The medium sprays just simply don't have a chance of depositing in the direction that you intend. They typically deposit on the windward side. And that is kind of the, the general observation. Windward side uh, for high booms, regardless of how you spray them. So the, the low boom and the, and the coarser spray helps offset that. And I would still say um, to strongly consider the coarser spray if you're going to use a, an angle spray. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trevor Anderson uh, asks, does nozzle spacing along the boom need to be smaller to achieve the lower boom heights required, particularly with PWM? Yeah, that's a great question because uh, the low boom, the reason we're at 20 and higher inches is, is of course, to provide adequate overlap. And in particular, the question uh, uh, that's asked talks about PWM. And for PWM, overlap is even more critical. So even 100% overlap may not be sufficient. You may have to go to 150 to make sure you, you cover the times when the, when the one nozzle is off and the two adjacent ones are covering for it. That overlap has to exist. They have to meet or maybe even overlap themselves. So yes, uh, we we may come to a point where a narrower fan angle or a narrower uh, nozzle spacing may be appropriate. But on the other hand, we are pointing the nozzles forward and backward. So even say at a 15 inch boom height, the travel distance of the spray is still 20 inches or so. We have a little calculator on Spurs 101 where you can figure that out. You add at any angle, any boom height, any fan angle, any forward angle and fan angle, so two different angles, and it'll tell you. Uh, what boom height you need to get the 100 or 150 uh, percent overlap that we just discussed. I'd say we're probably okay for now. Most nozzles are produced in um, in 110 degree fans, and then of course that that actual fan does vary by model and pressure. But we seem to not have an overlap issue. But when you're uh, boom on a PWM system when your nozzle size, for example, is improperly configured. Let's say that you, uh, your, your, your nozzle is too large and your duty cycle is therefore too low. You have periods of time when uh, you simply don't have a nozzle spraying and nobody covering for it. And the, the nozzle sizing is, all, is much more important and of course the overlap. So I think we're probably, at, as PWM becomes essentially the norm, more and more, uh, that may be part of that. So good question, thanks.